Dell's Venue 8 7000, A Striking Tablet That Falls Short of Greatness, by Andrew Cunningham. Dig out a piece of paper and a pencil and draw a generic tablet. It doesn't need to be any particular tablet, just imagine what you'd see if you walked into a Best Buy and started browsing. Chances are, you drew a symmetrical rectangle, and that's exactly what you get from most tablets. Smartphones and tablets tend to be dominated by their screens, and while OEMs can do a certain amount to give their tablets a unique feel, most of them look the same when you boil the device down to its most basic design elements. The most interesting thing about Dell's Venue 8 7000, or 7840, whatever it is you want to call it, is that it doesn't follow this design playbook. Instead of using conventional bezels, Dell's newest Android tablet has an 8.4-inch screen that extends nearly to the edges on three sides, with a larger chin at the bottom to serve as a handle and to house the speaker, webcam, and other components. If it resembles anything, it sharps Aquos crystal phones. Both Buck's smartphone and tablet design conventions in a similar way. When we picked up the venue, we were primarily interested in seeing how its unique design worked for day-to-day -day use. We've also run it through our standard battery of tests. There's no point in dropping $400 on something that looks cool if the battery life and performance aren't there. Are the insides as pretty as the outside, and how does it stack up to other tablets in the same price range? Specs at a glance, Dell Venue 87840, screen, 2560, 1608.4 inches, 359 ppi, old, OS, Android 4.4.4 KitKat, CPU, 2.33 GHz quad-core Intel Atom Z3580, RAM, 2 GB, GPU, Imagination Power VRG6430, Storage, 16 GB, Expandable via microSD by up to 512 GB, though the largest size currently available is 128 GB, networking, 433 Mbps 802.11 AC, Bluetooth 4.0, optional Intel LTE coming in May, ports, micro USB, headphone, camera, 8 MP rear camera, with real sense, 2 MP front camera, size, 8.50 inches x 4.88 x 0.24, 215.8 x 124.4 x 6 mm, weight, 0.67 pounds, 305 grams, battery, 5900 ma, non-removable, starting price, $399, look and feel, further reading, sharp surprises with a phone with super minimal bezels. We'll get to the other stuff but the venue's chin pretty much defines this tablet. Hate the chin, hate the venue. It's got its upsides and downsides, but in any case you have to retrain yourself and unlearn some habits that more conventional tablets have taught you. For example, you can pick up a regular Android or iOS tablet without having to worry so much about the orientation. The software will automatically rotate everything to be right side up. Standard symmetrical bezels mean that the tablet will feel the same no matter which way you're holding it. Especially on Android tablets that use on-screen navigation buttons, it truly makes no difference what way you're holding it. The time flexible orientation matters most is when you've got headphones or a micro USB cable plugged into the tablet while trying to use it. Say you're reading in bed and listening to some background music or holding the tablet while watching a video. It's nice to be able to rotate the headphone jack so it isn't poking into your chest or in the way of your hand. The Venue software will rotate just fine, but the razor-thin bezels on the top and sides mean that there's only one way to hold this thing, from the bottom, where the headphone jack and micro USB port also are. If you're right-handed and gripping the tablet in landscape mode, the headphone jack is right where your palm is. You've got to hold it with your left hand to avoid it. If you decide to unplug your headphones and listen to the front-facing speaker instead, things won't sound too bad. The speaker puts out a lot of sound, though like most tablet speakers it's light on the bass and it distorts just a bit at higher volumes. Unfortunately, its positioning across the chin means that it's easy to block with your hand. The thin bezels that the chin enables can also be finicky. Unlike the iPad Airs and Minis, the Venue, and most Android tablets, Really, 
doesn't have any kind of thumb rejection that helps it ignore accidental taps. To avoid this erroneous input, you need to hold the tablet by its chin or by, very carefully, palming it. Don't let those complaints give you the wrong idea. There is some really great stuff about the chin too. It gives your entire thumb a place to sit, so you can grip the tablet tightly between your thumb and fingers without worrying about dropping it. The thinner bezels on the other three sides help reduce the size and weight of the tablet, so the venue is incredibly thin and light. It has quickly become one of my favorite tablets to use with one hand. Once you get used to holding it from the bottom instead of from the sides, or wherever else you hold your current phone or tablet, it's pretty comfortable. The Nexus tablets are generally the standard by which other Android tablets are judged, and when compared to either the Nexus 9 or the 2013 Nexus 7, the venue has a decidedly high-end, premium feel. Its back is mostly aluminum, with a glass cutout for the rear-facing camera and glass backing where the chin is. The back is a bit logo Y. There is a Dell logo, an Intel Inside logo, and the typical FCC markings. But at least they're fairly subtle. While most tablets have a gradual curve to them, the venue is all hard edges. The top corners of the tablet and the seam between the back and the sides are all hard edges, and only the bottom corners are rounded at all. We didn't think this made the tablet uncomfortable to hold whether we were palming it or holding it by its chin, but it's another point of departure from conventional design. Compared to the tablet it's housed in, the 8.4 inch 2560, 1600 OLED screen is less unique. It looks great, though. Maximum brightness is a bit low at 231 nits, but OLED gives you solid contrast that makes it ideal for movie watching or reading in the dark. Though colors look a bit oversaturated, business as usual for this screen technology. 359 ppi is higher than most tablets, the Retina iPad minis are 326, the Nexus 9 is 281, the Shield tablet is 283, so text and images are nice and sharp. This also helps negate any adverse effects of the OLED subpixel arrangement. Those are invisible to the eye. It's a step up in quality from the screen in the also minus $399 Nexus 9, which is a decent but unexceptional IPS LCD panel with some backlight bleed around the edges. Oh yeah, there is a 3D camera, further reading, RealSense 3D camera gives PCs some Kinect-like capabilities. It doesn't get as much attention as its new CPUs, but for the last year or so Intel has quietly been pushing an initiative it calls RealSense. The name doesn't refer to any one component in particular, rather it's a collection of hardware and software that collectively wants to make it easier to interact with your devices via gestures and speech. The RealSense 3D camera hardware that's beginning to find its way into computers and tablets is primarily used as a depth sensor. On PCs with front-facing cameras, it will apparently enable gesture-based controls that will let you interact with things on the screen without actually touching the screen. Intel boasts that it supports finger-level tracking. On mobile devices, it's more like the dual camera setup that shipped with the HTC One M8. The venue's three rear cameras can take a picture that can then be manipulated after the fact to add fake bulk to your shots or to apply different filters to different parts of the image, making a background black and white, for example while the foreground remains in color. The RealSense implementation of these features is more flexible than HTC's implementation. The Dell Gallery app you need in order to manipulate RealSense enabled pictures will let you adjust the distance at which it starts applying its effects, so you could start blurring objects 20 feet back, rather than 10 feet. A similar feature that allows you to measure the distance between objects in a picture is apparently coming in another software update. Though the technology in the venue is more advanced than HTC's implementation, the pitfalls are mostly the same. The software isn't always good at totally isolating subjects from their backgrounds. Usually this is only visible around the edges of subjects. Cranking the faux depth of field all the way up definitely exposes some edge detection problems. Other times, larger parts of subjects in the foreground blended into the background layer anyway. Dell's tutorial says that the best depth accuracy is between 3 to 16 feet, 
and the RealSense camera becomes less effective if you stray too far from those recommendations. It probably doesn't help matters that the venue's 8MP rear camera is, well, a tablet camera. It's there, but it's pretty perfunctory. It produces sort of washed out looking shots indoors, and pictures get noisy fast as the light gets dimmer. Turning on the other two cameras used for real sense only seems to compound the problem. We'd be curious to see the kinds of shots real sense could take if it were attached to a premium smartphone camera instead. Intel's real sense 3D camera is demonstrated at CES 2014. Finally, there's that chin again. All three of the rear-facing cameras are positioned on the lower third of the tablet, and the primary camera is actually on the back of the chin. You know, the chin you're supposed to be holding the tablet by. It's awkward to hold the tablet steady without blocking one or more of the rear cameras or accidentally touching the screen. Same goes for the 2MP webcam, which is mounted in the chin instead of above the screen, as is common. The orientation isn't super flattering if you're holding the tablet by the chin, and whoever you're chatting with is going to end up looking up your nose. It's slightly better if you're holding the tablet in landscape mode or, delicately, by the top, but even then it's a bit strange to have the camera off-center. You may or may not care about this, depending on your video chatting habits, I don't do it much, and almost never on my phones or tablets, but it's probably the weirdest thing about the chin. Software, Dell ships the venue with a lightly customized build of Android 4.4.4. Though it has promised a lollipop update at some point, we have no idea when it's coming and Dell isn't saying. KitKat is still the single most commonly used version of Android today, so third-party software support won't be a problem. All of Google's apps, once updated, look and work the same whether they're on KitKat or Lollipop and as of a couple of weeks ago that applies to the Google Now launcher too. Just be aware that updates beyond Lollipop may or may not happen. The changes Dell makes to stock Android are mostly inoffensive. The settings screen is blue instead of black and has a few new sections, mostly related to the venue's unique hardware features. There's a flip to silence mode that will mute the tablet when it's face down on a flat surface. There are a few extra pre-installed apps. Beyond the Dell additions needed for real sense, the Dell Cast dongle and an equalizer app to adjust the way audio sounds. One nice touch is that Dell actually asks you which of its bundled third-party apps you actually want to install when you first set the tablet up. You can easily install Adobe Reader and a bunch of Amazon Media apps and Flipboard and a few other things, but they're not required. Not all pre-installed apps are optional, if it has a Dell logo on it. You can't escape McAfee antivirus products, but most of them are. Take note, other OEMs, internals and performance, and using Android with x86, the vast majority of Android devices out there use ARM chips from one supplier or another, but Android doesn't really care about what instruction set you're using most of the time. When you download an Android app, what you're usually downloading is architecture independent bytecode. A runtime layer, Dalvik by default on KitKat and previous versions, ART by default on Lollipop and optional in KitKat, actually compiles that code for your CPU architecture as the app is launched, Dalvik, or when the app is first installed, ART, so developers don't have to worry about compiling different apps to target different architectures. As a result, most Android devices are going to be able to run most Android apps regardless of whether it's powered by an ARM or an x86 or even a MIPS processor. Nearly all of the apps associated with my Google Play account would install on the venue just fine, and the ones that wouldn't were usually made to work with specific devices or carriers, were meant to run on phones and not tablets. I say nearly, because every once in a very great while, you're going to run into native Android apps that aren't written entirely in Java and so can't benefit from Dalvik or ART. Developers can create native apps that run just fine on multiple CPU architectures, but you'll still run into some that only support ARM chips. The recent Office apps for Android tablets are good examples. Microsoft has promised Intel-compatible versions within a quarter, but for now they're ARM only. It's a rare problem that you may never run into, but it's something you know you'll never run into with an ARM tablet.
Let's move on to the guts of this particular tablet. The venue is powered by a quad-core Intel Atom Z3580 that runs at a maximum speed of 2.33 GHz. The tablet versions of these Bay Trail Atoms included Imagination Technologies Power VR G6430 GPUs, and the venue pairs the SoCi with the standard 2 GB of RAM. CPU performance is actually quite good. In both single and multi-threaded performance, the Z3580 keeps pace with Qualcomm Snapdragon 80X chips. Apple's A7 and A8 and NVIDIA 64-bit Tegra K1 all use fewer, higher performing cores, so they pull ahead in single-threaded performance even, though the quad-core OCS still don't look bad for multi-threaded workloads. GPU performance, however, remains a problem for Intel. The Power VR G6430 is more or less the same GPU that Apple uses in its A7, a chip that has been around for over a year now. It does okay. Despite the venue's higher resolution display, the Atom comes close to the iPad Mini 2's scores in the on-screen native resolution tests. It's just that the iPad Air 2, the Nexus 9, and the Shield tablet all run circles around it. We're inclined to blame the slowest GPU for the stuttering and jerkiness that sometimes accompanies animations or transitions between apps. It doesn't ruin the experience and it doesn't happen all the time, but you'll notice it as you hop around. Games may sometimes be a little choppier than they are on competing tablets as well. 3D games like Asphalt 8, Airborne ran on the venue, but it wasn't quite as smooth as it is on faster GPUs, or, at least, GPUs that are better suited to the displays they're driving. The rest of the stuff inside the venue is pretty standard. Its storage performance isn't setting any records, but it's pretty solid. There's 433 Mbps single stream 802.11 AC Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 4.0, and Dell says that an LTE option, powered by an Intel XMM7260 modem, is coming in May. The one thing it lacks relative to other Android tablets is NFC, which has long been a standard feature in mid to high end Android devices. Its absence would be more conspicuous in a phone, but it's still something you get in most other Android tablets. Battery life, for our Wi-Fi browsing battery life test, we set every tablet's screen to 200 nits with colorimeters and let the devices cycle through web pages until they die. The venue lasted for nearly 10 hours putting it pretty near the top of the charts in this test? It outdoes all the iPads, the Nexus 9, and the Surface Pro 3, all of which hover somewhere between 8 and 9 hours. iPads use so much less power than Android tablets when idle that, for workloads with a lot of idle time, Apple's tablets will still probably go longer between charges, but still. The 2013 Nexus 7 is in the same ballpark, and NVIDIA Shield tablet falls way short of everything. Our newer WebGL test puts continuous stress on the CPU and GPU to simulate gaming or other, more intensive activities. We haven't tested quite as many devices with this yet, but the venue looks competitive. Having a stronger GPU generally penalizes you in this test, which is why the venue and original iPad mini hang in there for a bit longer. The iPad Air 2 appears to be the exception to that rule despite its much more powerful GPU. Worth a look, but it's not a must-have. I don't know that the venue represents the future of phone and tablet design, but there is no denying that it's unique among the current crop of Android tablets. It's definitely got a lot of competition, though. The most notable are probably the $399 Nexus 9, NVIDIA's $299 Shield tablet, and the 8.4-inch $349 version of the Galaxy Tab S. The Shield and the Galaxy both have lower sticker prices, and NVIDIA has been nearly as aggressive as Google in updating its tablet to Lollipop. The downside with the Shield is its mediocre battery life. The downside with the Galaxy is the messy touch with skin and a spotty track record for Android updates, you'll probably get a couple, but they won't come quickly. The Nexus will get quick updates for at least a couple of years, but its screen isn't as nice, its body is quite a bit larger, it has no SD card slot, if that's a thing you care about, and the build quality is underwhelming for the price. Compared to all of those tablets, the venue's biggest liability, 
aside from its uncertain update future, is probably its Intel SoC. CPU performance is good but GPU performance is mediocre, and the tablet's UI has some persistent jerkiness that you really shouldn't have to put up with for $400. The vast majority of Android apps don't care whether you're running ARM or x86, but you may still run into some exceptions. The second problem, once you zoom out to look at the wider landscape, is that pricing this thing at $400 puts it smack dab in the middle of iPad territory. iOS and Android have fought each other to a functional draw on smartphones. Each platform has its own strengths and weaknesses but we'd have no problem recommending either to the majority of buyers. When it comes to tablets, Android still very much treats them like big phones, while Apple's tablets both, one, have a stronger app selection and, two, have more apps that take advantage of the extra screen size and power available. 400 Canadian dollars get you either a first generation iPad Air or an iPad Mini 3. Though we pocket the $100 and go with an iPad Mini 2 if you're looking at small Apple tablets. The Venue is one of the more interesting Android tablets in this price range, but unless you're dead set on running Android, an iPad is probably going to be a better use of your money. The good, unique, interesting design that defies tablet conventions, looks nice, and works most of the time. Great screen. Very thin, light, and easy to hold. It's an 8.4-inch tablet that feels more like a 7-inch tablet. Premium build quality. Good CPU performance and battery life. The bad, GPU performance lags behind other tablets in its price bracket. No NFC. Interesting real sense effects are held back by a mediocre camera. You'll very occasionally run into apps that don't run on Intel processors. Pretty expensive for an Android tablet. Though now that the 2013 Nexus 7 is gone it's harder to find truly great Android tablets between $200 and $250. The ugly, the chin sometimes gets in the way, and it's hard to completely avoid accidentally 